All right. I have straight up noon. Are we ready to go? Hope so. Ready when you are, CB. All right. Let's see. So, uh, <clears throat> welcome everyone to uh, the Science Circle and our continuing series of panel discussions. Uh, we have a little bit uh, something special for you today. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, Delia Lake uh, approached me. Apparently, uh, some people in uh, chat had mentioned how much they like the book Ministry for the Future, and she thought it would be fun to have a discussion about the book. Um, so she approached me about, uh, you know, setting up a, a book discussion, and, uh, and I decided to somehow make that try to work with our panel discussions. So, um, so that's what we're going to try to do today. And let's hope that this uh, turns out to be fun. Um, uh, so to discuss ministry for the future. Oh, wait, before I continue, I do want to make a housekeeping announcement that the Science Circle is a grant funded nonprofit organization for um, developing virtual worlds um, as an educational platform. So I want to remind everyone to be on your best behavior, please. And uh, feel free to comment or ask questions in nearby chat and text. Um, so we have with us today um, uh, Natalie Foster, uh, who is familiar to uh, us here in Science Circle, uh, Marianne Clark, who is Max Chatnoir, and, and uh, Natalie Asumo, and um, and we have Linda Morris, who is Delia Lake, um, and uh, and then my uh, yours truly, um, Baragon Betts slash Matt Burr. Um, for those who are interested um, uh, from this discussion, if you want to follow some additional resources about it, I want to uh, point out there's a note card giver right here in front of me, in Second Life, uh, with has a note card. Uh, with a bunch of uh, extra resources you could look into that was compiled for us um, by Shiloh. So I want to thank Shiloh for that too. Um, so, so Ministry for the Future has uh, created quite a bit of buzz. It's a um, uh, what they call hard science fiction. Um, this particular book is about climate change the premise of the book is that under the Paris Climate Accords, um, a new ministry is formed, an agency is formed um, uh, with the idea, basically what happens is that um, the, the life of the future um, or future life on planet Earth is bestowed with legal rights. And in order to protect and defend the legal rights of future life, the Ministry for the Future is created. So it has um, sort of legal and administrative authority to promote mm -hmm. the interests of future life. And um, the book opens with a, a description of uh, a traumatic climate change uh, trauma, which is a heat wave in India that kills 20 million people. And this event is so traumatizing that it radicalizes um, not just people in India, but sort of radicalizes the whole world. Um, and this sort of galvanizes the Ministry for the Future to act. And um, the, in order to fulfill its promise of defending the future, it is, the ministry is increasingly pressured to undertake radical action, increasingly radical action to, uh, to get its mission accomplished. Um, and this has to be done also with the complicating factor of rogue actors um, such as uh, groups within India who have become radicalized and sort of act on their own sort of as a terrorist group. 
uh, to to fight uh, what they can consider sort of criminal polluters. Additionally, there is blowback by the power structures that are invested in the status quo. And that blowback, that pushback from the power, the powers that be uh, becomes very intense also. So, um, so the book sort of, um, uh, that's kind of the sort of the sort of the dramatic context of the action that happens in the book. Um, but the book also um, goes into just ex extraordinary detail about many, many issues um, that we would have to confront uh, to really effectively address climate change. And that's part of the fun of the book is, um, is the, the really detailed dis discussions of all the different factors that we would have to address. Um, so with that said, um, I now want to uh, um, uh, ask our uh, panelists to weigh in also. I'm going to ask uh, Sumo to, um, to start off to start us off and tell us a little bit about the author, Kim Stanley Robinson, um, and uh, sort of kind of give you a little bit of context about where he's coming from. So, Sumo, why don't you take over? <clears throat> well, thank you, Burr. I really appreciate that. And uh, I trust everyone can hear me. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and first of all, before I launch into this, I really want to thank everyone in Science Circle for making me feel very welcome. I'm a bit of a newbie here. It's daunting to do this sort of thing, but uh, uh, you all have made me feel welcome and, and everyone in the, in the group that I've met has just been delightful. So I thank you in advance. And I also want to shout out especially a thank you to Shiloh for the excellent set of references she's put together on that note card. Um, among the best ones, I think, are some of the book reviews, and I commend the reading of those to you as well as, as of course, the book. Well, as, uh, uh, as has been said, Ministry for the Future is, is a book of hard science fiction, but really people consider Kim Stanley Robinson not a science fiction author so much as an author of re what's called realistic fiction. Um, He's always been much more interested in the political sciences as opposed to the hard sciences, but the man knows an incredible amount of, of hard science. He's up on just about everything that goes on. Um, this particular book is in a subcategory of science fiction that's now referred to as cli-fi or climate fiction. And the reasons for that will become obvious as we talk more and more about it. The New Yorker did a review of Kim Stanley Robinson back in 2014, where they posed the question, is he our greatest political novelist? Well, in a book review of Ministry for the Future that Bill McKibben wrote in the New York Review of Books in 2020, he finally answers that question and he says the answer is indeed yes. Um, in terms of what goes on in this book, Robinson treats climate change really as a tool for moving the system. And by the system, he means by moving political will. And as Robinson says, because chemistry and physics won't be denied the way morality and justice can be denied. And so he uses climate change as the tool to move the system to make it deal with, as one might say, the whole wretched mess we've managed to make of things. This is not just um, the mess we've made of the environment, but the, but the mess we've made of society as far as inequality is concerned and a variety of other items that come into play very, very strongly in the book. The other thing I think you need to know about uh, Robinson is that he's not, he's not really a utopian, um, but he's what uh, Bill McKibben refers to as anti-dystopian. And I interpret that to mean that he's realistic to the very core. This book is set in the year 2040, so it's a scant 20 years ahead of where we are now. And as Burr already pointed out, it opens like a slow motion disaster movie. The first 50 pages I found incredibly difficult to read. And once I got through this horrific tragedy that takes place in India where 20 million people die because of an extraordinary heat wave, 
I had to put it away for a while because I was just, I was just really incredibly blown away by the whole thing. Um, this initial disaster, however, gives rise to one of the protagonists in the novel, a fellow named Frank, who's a survivor of this heat wave because he was in India at the time as a worker. And he ends up with just horrific PTSD as a result of, of his survivor guilt and just the trauma he goes through during this heat wave when all of these people die. Uh, Frank also comes into um, contact with a woman named Mary Murphy, who is the chair of the um, so-called Ministry for the Future. And as Burr said, that ministry was um, formed as a result of the event in India that caused all the horrific, horrific deaths. And um, it was formed by uh, the parties who were members of the, of the Paris Accord. Um, in terms of where Robinson is coming from in writing this book, he got his PhD in literature from UCSD and his PhD topic was the novels of Philip K. Dick. Now, if you know Philip K. Dick, um, he's, I think dystopian is a fair adjective to describe him. He wrote uh, Blade Runner. You probably know that movie. He wrote, uh, uh, or Blade Runner rather, was, was based on a novel he wrote called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And this is what Robinson comes from intellectually. However, in terms of this book, um, Robinson, who has, uh, has 19 novels to his credit, has really experienced an arc in his thinking that I think is described by several of the novels that I'd also like to refer you to. Um, he did a series of three novels, Red Mars, Green Mars, and Blue Mars, in the 1990s that really involved the terraforming of Mars or the effort to terraform Mars by a small group of earthlings who uh, decided to colonize it. And it's really an essay on how humans can settle an uninhabitable place. It deals with a lot of the same science NASA was talking about at the time. And it um, poses some very interesting questions about terraforming as, as well as about the sociological questions of how groups get together to make something happen. The next trilogy he wrote was in the early 2000s, 40 Signs of Rains, 50, 50 Degrees Below Zero, and 60 Days and Counting. These have now been put together in a volume called Green Earth, where Robinson has taken out some of the explanatory things. I saw someone in chat talk about how he has sometimes sort of uh, um, goes on and on about things. But in Green Earth, he's taken out some of the things that he now feels people are really up on, so he didn't need to detail in the novels. These three novels detail with detail uh, a scenario in Washington, D.C., where first of all, the whole city becomes entirely waterlogged and swamped because of a Katrina-like event. In, 50 de in uh, 40 degrees below, both the um, U.S. coast and Northern Europe are subjected to an extreme cold snap. And it's all again about climate change and how we deal with that. And in 60 Days and Counting, he talks about the political realities of trying to deal with um, an entire island nation that ends up being displaced because of sea level rise. Um, he then, in about 2015, writes a, a very elegant little book, I thought, called Aurora. But literally what he talks about in there is why interstellar colonization won't work. And I think that's a pivotal book because I think there's a, there's a real danger in fantasizing about space travel and that it creates kind of a moral hazard. One begins to care less about the fate of our own world. And I think that's why Aurora is an important book here because he gets us away from thinking about interstellar travel. And indeed, he even gets us away, of th uh, away from thinking about terraforming Mars and colonizing another planet in that regard. The final book in the series of the 19 that he's written that I wanna mention is one called New York 2140 where he starts with the observation that lower Manhattan is 50 feet lower in altitude than upper Manhattan. So when the deluge comes, 
Lower Manhattan is gone uh, up to about, oh, I think probably 20th Street, gone in the sense of being underwater. And it's, a, it's an incredible book about how New York manages that and then how the world manages the sea level rise. The final point I'll, I'll leave you with in terms of uh, this arc that Dick, that um, um, Robinson is on in terms of his writing is that, uh, in effect, I think the book in large part is a channel for, uh, is a challenge for us to get moving on some of these things. As one of the reviewers of the book said as his tagline for his review, uh, if you're reading this, you are the ministry for the future get back to work. And I think that's an interesting point to hang on to here. Um, Robinson is essentially a positivist. I think he's essentially an optimist, but uh, he's also challenging us to recognize and value the planet we have and um, be willing to run some experiments to save it. So at this point, after this brief introduction of Robinson and how he got to what he considers his capstone novel, he has said in several reviews that this might be the last novel he writes. Um, I will now uh, pass the torch, I guess, to Max, who will uh, chat with us about some of her thoughts on the book in general. Max, take um, it down. If I Thank actually, you, if I can, if do you mind if I interrupt for just a moment uh, before Max begins? Well, I don't mind if Max doesn't mind. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to, uh, forgive me, Max, uh, but I did just want to quickly point out, uh, with respect to uh, Cli-Fi, I just wanted to mention, um, I think another author that fits in that category is Jeff Vandermeer, who wrote the Southern Reach trilogy, which includes the book Annihilation, which was in, adapted into a really, really interesting movie. So I just wanted to mention that very quickly. Um, and then also, just quickly, I wanted to mention that I would love to see a debate between Robinson and Elon Musk about colonizing the solar system, and the, the uh, because I think that uh, I think that could get anyway because I think they they have diametrically different views about that, so that would be interesting. Um, okay, so uh, thank you for indulging me with that, uh, Max. Go ahead with, uh, but please make some. Uh, uh, go ahead with your remarks. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Okay, well, um, ironically, I was reading this while the big freeze hit Texas, so I had my own experience with climate disaster. Um, but this is, a, this is a big, complicated book. While I was reading it, I took about 40 pages of notes, and I extracted a, a bunch of different topics that I, that I thought were important, and I just want to mention four of them. I'm not going to mention them at length. Uh, one of them is population issues. Uh, and he makes it quite clear that if we do not take that in hand, nature will do it for us. We can control our own reproduction or we can let pandemics and natural disasters do it, which is much more unpleasant. Um, second thing is the problem of economic disparity with a tenth percent of the world population ordering owning 50% of the assets, that disparity has to be reduced somehow. And there are some suggestions made in the book, which I won't go into right now. Uh, third thing is the importance of cognitive error. We can look at the same set of events and see them in quite different ways. And, and I think one of the most uh, dramatic Examples of that is the recent United States election and its uh, consequences. And the last thing I want to just bring up is uh, one of the things he brings up is the possibility of using uh, carbon coins or carbon taxation as a foundation for a new economic system. Um, and, and I think that's all I'm going to say right now. So those, those are four things that I thought would be worth discussing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, yes, Max, uh, I, I was very pleased that he did. He was explicit about the population issue. And also I found the, um, the, um, the blockchain mechanism very interesting. Also, one of the, one of the sort of surprising, I think, consequences of, 
of uh, shifting the global economy to a blockchain system is the transparency that it um, uh, that it creates, um, so that all financial transactions globally are completely transparent, um, and that uh, this kind of uh, you know kind of keeps everyone in check. And I, you know, that was actually kind of a surprising idea to me. So, uh, so that was, um, uh, um, and and he, he also the way, you know, he sort the way he describes sort of the, you know, in the book the, the way he describes it is that, um, that instead of sort of trying to convince um, the status quo financial powers to change. Uh, what happens is that the the the, the pro ministry factions simply create a parallel economy using blockchain, and and, uh, and that this parallel economy just simply becomes, you know, so much more uh, influential and just gradually sort of begins to dominate the economy. So they're. You know what I mean? So it also it's kind of emerges sort of organically from the situation. Uh, they just they don't wait to try to convince people. They just act. They create sort of a parallel, a parallel reality um, uh, without, you know, they're just not going to put up with anybody's BS anymore. So I, I, I thought that was all very interesting. Well, there is uh, a lot of discussion about the role of the world banks. There certainly is. And I yes. And also sort of capitalism itself and sort of how are we going yeah. to how are we going to transform because in order to address climate change really at the scale we need to um we really have to um transform um uh, our economic principles um and and he doesn't shy away from uh from any of those discussions it's very interesting so uh um all right uh delia uh, uh Please uh, share with us uh, your opening remarks. Okay, so I want to do a couple of things here. Um, as you all know, here in Second Life, I uh, work a lot with environmental habitats. And I can do this primarily because most of my work in my adult career has been working with systems. And uh, so this book, The Ministry for the Future, uh, brings in, for me, work that I have done for decades. But the very first thing I want to do here is to help people imagine. Because if we can't imagine something we can't do anything about it. And that's one of the things that uh, Max was referring to as the, the dissonance here. So we have a cognitive disability and um, it is talked about various places in the book that um, we can know something, but we can't imagine that it could happen to us individually. Yeah, it could actually happen to you, but it's not going to happen to me. So I want to take you back to the beginning of the book and to what Sumo was saying about India and the heat wave. Um, and this is described in very realistic terms. But imagine when you have been hot in your life. A time when you have been hot and sweaty and you can't get any relief. <laughs> no matter what you do, there's no shade, there's no water to drink, there's nothing. You're just standing there, then sitting there, then lying there in your own sweat. And then all of a sudden, you don't sweat. Because when the heat gets that hot, then you die. When the sun is beating down that hard, and there is no relief, you do not sweat. Sweat is the way that our bodies transfer out heat 
and when the temperature on the outside is so much hotter than our body temperature, that whole biological mechanism shuts down. And what do you think happens? You die. People die. And people die in masses. And this has happened um, in Europe in summers. This has happened, in fact, around the world in summers already. So while the scale of 20 million is beyond what we have had so far, this is not only not out of the realm of possibility, but if we keep going at the rate we're going, it is likely. Um, so yes, the, uh, you know that, um, uh, you know, he talks about, um, you know, people pouring into lakes to try to cool off, but the, the lake water is just, you know, is warm too, and it provides no relief. And then Frank notices that the, the lake is just full of dead bodies. It's just, you know, it's horrifying. It's horrifying. Uh, and um, so there's this um, little meme that goes around in the consulting world that uh, says that if you have a frog in a pot and you cook the, heat the water uh, slowly, the frog will die because it won't jump out. That's not true. Frogs will jump out, but humans apparently won't. And this is what we are doing to ourselves. Um, I also want to put into the chat here my favorite Philip K. Dick quote, because I think it is relevant here. And it fits not only this book, but it fits um, our lives today. So that reality is that which, when we stop believing in it, it doesn't go away. Sometimes the appropriate response to reality is to go insane, and that's what happened to Frank. But reality that few refuses to go away, reality is that which refuses to go away. So we have, as human beings, a really um, amazing capability of fooling ourselves, of believing that uh, something will work out. Someone else will be able to fix this. I don't have to act now. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It won't happen to me. Um, it won't happen to my family. Oh, gee, they, the town next door was taken out by a tornado. The town next door was taken out by a flood, but it wasn't my town. And time and time again, um, the Robinson is pointing out these things in the book. Yeah, that's right. You know, I think um, it would be helpful here to <clears throat> to describe really the, the the pivotal, in addition to the heat wave, the other pivotal moment in the book. So, um, so the head of the uh, Ministry for the Future is a woman. Is is her name Mary? Mary. Mary Murphy. Mary. Yeah, Mary, Mary Murphy. Yeah. Yes. So. Um, so, uh, Frank tracks down Mary Murphy and takes her hostage in her own apartment and, um, basically just, uh, engages her, um, in a, uh, in a dialogue, basically challenging her saying, you know, your job is to protect the future life of the planet and you're not doing anything or whatever you're doing is not working. And so you have to be prepared to take extraordinary actions, um, including, for example, you know, targeted assassinations. And you need to be able to also like 
like really harm the financial centers and the um, and the gigantic corporations that are criminal polluters. You have to hurt them where it's really going to be a disincentive for them to keep polluting and really make it count. And um, and he's I have to say, I love this is a fantastic scene. And Frank is incredibly persuasive about the power, essentially, of terrorism uh, to affect change in a desperate situation. And um, um, and eventually the police come because they they sort of tracked Frank on surveillance cameras to her apartment. And when she goes down to an answer the door with the police are there, Frank escapes out the back. Um, so that kind of ends the scene. But but that dialogue with Frank lingers with Mary throughout the rest of the book. And she and uh, she continues to sort of have a dialogue with him for the rest of the book. And in fact, she does essentially um, begin to implement sort of black ops operations to um, uh, to really put the fear of God into these criminal polluters, which then, of course, predictably generates a backlash. Um, and they begin, so the, um, the status quo power brokers also begin to use sort of black ops operations. And it almost becomes like a war between the future and the present. Um, and uh, it gets actually quite exciting. So um, uh, how, how did you all respond to that? I mean, what, what, do, um, what, do, what do you guys make of Frank? Well, I think there's more to it than that. Uh, if you, because the, the black ops have been going on all along, but unbeknownst to Mary. Uh, right. Uh, what is it? The, the, the uh, Shiva with the group in India, the, she was children, of Kali. children of Kali. Children of Kali, the children of Kali, yes, which is but essentially also, a terrorist group. Yeah, but also her. Uh, Frank tries to join and is rejected from, I think. That's right, which, which gnaws at him. Also, her second in command um, is his name. Uh, yes, uh, that was fantastic. When yes. I love that scene when he sort of, sort of reveals to her what's been going on behind her back. Yeah. Yeah, but I want to get back to one, like one thing here, and that is that this, again, is not not only not out of the realm of possibility, but it is the um, what is happening on the uh, global scale with the agreements that com countries have made and companies as well with the uh, UN Global Compact um, is that we aren't making progress. So yes. that on every Don't level, promises. sustainable development goals, the report that came out a few months ago, we're failing. We are not only not making progress, we are falling behind on poverty. We are falling behind on uh, zero hunger, on some of the, the big things. We are not making progress at all. Um, and this inaction is setting up a whole chain of events for us for the future. Um, do you think do you think it's possible that sort of anti-globalist forces like Steve Bannon and Donald Trump and um, Boris Johnson and even Putin, let's say, um, or maybe Modi in India, that these anti-globalist, um, you know, they kind of want to, they want weak governments. Um, uh, they sort of want uh, chaos. Um, and is this, an, in a, I mean, do you think one of the motivators for this kind of, what I consider just a bizarre philosophy, um, is kind of the early inklings of the pushback against changes for uh, to to save us from climate change i think the recent activity for voter suppression is part of that i'd never really thought about it in those terms but it kind of makes sense when you think about it that they're terrified you know i i saw that um ministry for the future is in barack obama's list of favorite books yeah but, 
but when I was reading it, I was thinking, man, if I were a world leader, I would be terrified because Ministry for the Future is a manifesto for radical action on climate change mm. and, a, and a really persuasive manifesto. And if I was a political leader, I would be scared of it. Well, yeah, I think there's some other things that we need to bring in here. Um, a couple of them. One of the words that keeps popping up throughout the book is just. Yes. And the societies that we have developed around the world are anything but just. Uh, and in various ways, uh, I have alluded to a number of these issues in the book that I wrote with colleagues, the Sustainable Enterprise Field Book. But one of the things I want to bring up here is the, uh, an incident, and there are little vignettes throughout the book. And this is um, a mine, a rare earth minerals mine in Nambia. It doesn't say which one mineral or which minerals, but uh, all of our electronics that we depend on, including here on our computers in Second Life right now, uh, require minerals that... It's uh, the lithium, they, the lithium mines in Namibia. Yeah. 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 When they, they are, and some of these are not actually rare minerals, but they are not equal distributed around the world and they are in locations where the governments are um, not always reliable stable partners so he brings that in as a little vignette um, so all of these things contribute to what is um, going on um, in the book but also they have corollaries in our day-to-day -day lives right now. So that um, looking at these and all of this, taking this in the book from a systems perspective, he's pointing out where some of the uh, leverage points are, where the inflection points are, and where the any place in these uh, scenarios, something changes, it's going to ripple through the entire system. Um, uh, Delia, one moment. I, I wanted to bring attention or at least speak in voice for our uh, recorded version of this. Uh, Stephen makes a really good point. Uh, he says the author, um, Kim Stanley Robinson, in an interview wanted to be careful not to be an advocate of extreme terrorism, even for a just cause. So he made sure that the motivating event for the children of Kali was sufficiently scary, but also he made them not killers, but saboteurs. Yeah. And that, that's true. That In fact, there's a, an extended monologue in one of the chapters of the book from some unnamed person, I think, from the children of Kali that specifically talks about that, 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 they, um, uh, that they recognize that killing is a sin, um, and uh, a lot of what the children of Kali do is really throwing a monkey wrench into the machinery of capitalism, for example, mm -hmm. um, causing systems to sort of break down um, and that sort of thing. So, uh, so I think that's a, I wanted to make sure that that, that, that point got made in voice. Yeah, and that, that's Steve, wait, There's also another point I think that, that we're overlooking here is that all of the terrorism in the book isn't done by the children of Kali. There are several other unnamed groups or unattributed groups who do kill, who, who yes. knock airplanes out of the sky until people don't fly anymore. I mean, there is a good portion of violence there. I just want to point out that there's a very interesting thing, I think, that, that Robinson does in structuring these characters because he make, Mary Murphy is Irish. And she remembers, she's old enough to remember what were, would be called the troubles, correct? So she knows and, and speaks very adamantly against terrorism and against that kind of taking of life. But then she comes around at the end to recognize, as you all pointed out, that sometimes behavior like that can be the only thing that, that can catalyze change when when things like um, 
morality and justice are denied. You know, and, and Robin and Stephen made a good point. Robinson doesn't endorse violence, but he has to admit that uh, um, it is effective in terms of generating change in some of the entrenched systems where change is necessary. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very complex book in that regard, but I think it's no accident that he made Mary Murphy Irish and gave her then inherently this ability to think about an, a terrorism in a way, both experientially and otherwise, that, that other characters haven't, uh, um, in a hadn't, hadn't, don't have that privilege, I'll put it that way. So I think it's very interesting structurally in that regard. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yes, I, I agree too, yeah. I think also that uh, we wanna uh, bring up here that he, focuses on um, finance as a driver, money, um, and banks, and that if we are going to make the changes that we have to engage the people who are um, controlling the, the commerce, Yes, and this is um, so. I was kind of struck by this idea, and correct me if I if I don't remember correctly, but um, but uh, you know, I think it, it emerges out of India. Uh, one of the mechanisms for transforming the financial system is the um, the adoption of sort of public ownership yes. of of uh, of capital and of you know uh, technology and of of uh, projects. They're owned by the public, um, and um, uh, this sort of makes gives everyone kind of a, a vested interest in um, in making it work and and the outcome and so forth. And and I I found that his description of uh, uh, of that transformation of the economy through public ownership pretty darn persuasive. Yeah, he starts off by talking about in one of his other little vignettes about the uh, um, employee owned, well, um, um, it's a whole series of companies, actually, a uh, Mondragon in Basque country in uh, northern Spain, and the history of that. So he's talking about employee ownership of companies and that thread then goes again through various other little places in the book. Yeah, there's another book out now, the name of which is eluding me and I apologize for this, but the but Robinson deals with the same premise that that book discusses, that you cannot expect um, industries whose profit is based on, you know, the, the capitalistic system to, to be the ones who affect the change, but they can be part of the change and they can be forced to change. Yeah. Uh, George said something about, you know, you don't make much money, you don't make profits if your uh, if your uh, clientele are dead, and that's absolutely right. And and you know, Robinson gets into that issue of of how you can force by by public will and and public outcry uh, companies to do certain things. Um, you know, I understand. Example, you know, quite frankly, Walmart is on the record as saying they don't oppose a minimum wage and they wish we would enact a minimum wage because they'd like to pay their people more, but then they're cutting themselves off at the pass if they do that in a capitalistic system. But if everybody has to pay their employees more, then everybody, you know, that will be the tide that raises all boats. Then everybody will do that. They can't do it alone, but they can be forced to do it by public action. And I think that's one of uh, I think that's one of Robinson's points. He considers himself, I think, a uh, uh, what one might call a democratic socialist with a nod to Bernie Sanders. But I think that's why. Yeah, uh, you know, one of the things that always bugs me about this uh, minimum wage uh, discussion here in the states and also. Um, the um, the COVID relief packages and so forth um, is that it's so weird that conservatives push back against that because it's so clear even from the days of Adam Smith 
that what you want to do is have money circulating in the economy. And how do you get money circulating? Is you give money to people so they spend it. Um, you know, the, if the population has money to spend, that's what keeps the economy growing. Whereas if you give tax breaks to the wealthy, they just sequester the money out of the economy. They suck money out of the economy. Um, this notion that the rich will, re will invest their money in their, in their plants or in their employees is just a bunch of crap because those are costs to their business. They're not going to increase, they're not going to, they're not going to increase worker wages because that just adds to their costs. And they're electric, not going to invest in modernizing companies. their plants because that's just a cost and costs lower your profits. So I do not understand the logic that making the rich richer is better than making the poor richer. You know, um, Robinson also does an interesting thing where he talks about uh, the fact that, that there is enough there is enough in the world for everybody to live reasonably. And he gives a couple very interesting scenarios that describe this and how one could achieve it. And, and you know, it's, um, it's something that I think he addresses that's part of his, his, his forte in this, you know, that, that we do have enough. And, and, and I think that's part of what we're getting at here. And it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, everybody's so afraid of the word socialism, you know, it's like the S word now. But, you know, there would be fantastic changes possible and fantastic uh, uh, quality of life improvements possible if if things were just more evenly distributed. And again, he goes through this in, at considerable de detail in several of the chapters. The alternative uh, yes. is to have more people spending a little bit of money than to have fewer people spending more money, which right, is right. better. Well, as he points out, money itself has its own gravitational attraction in the sense that once you have some, that quantity of money wants to have other money around it. So it tends to become money for money's sake as opposed to money for any other purpose. And and I think that's a, that's a kind of humorous way to think about it, but I think it's very true. Um, it is. One of the things here is that he touches on the uh, modern monetary theory as well, the MMT, and that uh, one of the premises is that everybody who wants a job should be able to have a job. But I think one of the key areas that we haven't mentioned here because it relates to the civilization and what maintains a civilization or collapses a civilization, and that's the issue of trust. So without trust, money has no value, but without trust, you don't have, you have anarchy and you don't have a functioning civilization either. Now, one of the mechanisms he talks about for creating a kind of this, uh, what is it called? The, the carbon coin, yes. for example, yeah. he, he had a very interesting discussion about quantitative easing, mm -hmm. um, which I don't fully understand. So if you all know more about it than I do, but I, I do understand it's a mechanism, for example, that the Fed uses in the United States to basically create money out of nothing, out of thin air. Um, and it's a way that you can regulate the money supply to, for example, to keep uh, inflation down, for example. Well, well, Bear, I think you just made, you said the key word. Money is trust. You know, that's all there is to it. I mean, the, yeah. there is no difference in value in a raw sense between the $1 bill in your pocket and the $20 bill and the $100 bill you may get if you gamble at the casino, let's say. But the point is you trust that that piece of paper will be negotiable for some other item that you want. So the whole thing is just based on trust. And he builds up a sense of trust in this carbon coin that enables him to make certain other changes societally and also um, uh, uh, technically in the world to ease the climate problem. So, you know, one of the problems we have in understanding money is the fact that we think it's real yeah. and it's not real at all. Money is just trust. Yeah, all of the uh, major currencies today are fiat currencies. We're no longer pegged to, to gold. That's Yeah, I love that term, fiat currencies. Yeah, we're, and, we're pegged to uh, nothing. You know, one of the things I think he is really does really good in this book is kind of explode a lot of the assumptions we make about the way we live now and how 
how sort of ad hoc they are, and they're not really grounded in any um, in any tangible reality. They're just conventions that we've agreed upon, and so and that if we want to create a new future, all we have to do is, as one of the my the topics of one of my earlier panel discussions, is have a paradigm shift. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to put my favorite Philip Dick quote back again into <laughs> because this is exactly. <laughs> There's some talking about it, uh, a, a group of people that agree to use no more than 2,000 kilowatt hours per year, I think. Yes. And um, I, I checked my electric bills, and I'm way over that. Yeah. Uh, but I've been trying conscientiously to reduce the amount of power that I use. It's incredibly difficult. So I want to shift gears a little bit because uh, while we still have time, but I also wanted to talk about some of the um, some of the ways he talks about addressing the the uh, physical manifestations of climate change. For example, he has a lot. A lot of the book takes place in Antarctica, yes. and. Um, and one of the issues with the uh, with the the polar ice caps is that they're melting, and the the meltwater um, runs down in vertical rivers through cracks in the ice cap down to the bedrock of the planet, and then that water on the bedrock sort of spreads out beneath the solar ice caps and causes them to slide. So one of the big projects that's undertaken in the book is to pump the water out um, so that the ice caps don't slide. Um, and that's just sort of one of the sort of um, horrible problems that we're confronted with that, you know, that he does, again, he doesn't shy away from it. He kind of, you know, he, he, he goes all in talking about how to, um, um, uh, how to, how we can address some of these um, really big problems. Yeah, let me, uh, I have, actually have a slide that speaks to that, if I can get it to come up here. I've forgotten what number it is, so I'm, I'm fishing around here for it. But the point is, I he's been, no, no, this isn't it. This is the, okay. be, this is the Arctic. This is, a, this is a different one. But um, uh, he spends probably more time uh, in Antarctica, on the science there, than in any other place in the uh, in the uh, uh, whole book, and and Burr is right. He he talks the the situation in Antarctica is that uh, the the glaciers are. <laughs> I'm sorry, the little comic relief there is not what I wanted to go to. Um, the glaciers are moving faster into the sea. And why is that? That's because Ant Antarctica, as the Arctic as well, is warming. So more of the ice on the surface is melting. The ice then, the, that meltwater goes down through fissures to the very base of the glacier, one, two kilometers down. And um, the glacier then, instead of having to move over rock and dirt or whatever is the soil in Antarctica is now floating on that water despite all the pressure. So he goes into considerable detail about how one can use the um, technology, technology we already have to, that's, that's available in Antarctica to stop this glacial melt. And this picture that's in the lower left-hand corner of the slide isn't the best one, but it'll give you the right idea. You've got the, sure, it is a, it is a, um, a situation that is really back here in this slide, all along the, the ground between the glacier and, and the surface is, is now this, this uh, literally river of water. And it, the glaciers are sliding along that river of water. And that river of water is just increasing constantly in quantity because as the glacier moves faster, the shear forces get higher and that causes even more melting down at that surface. So you have increased shear surface, uh, increased shear 
fric increasing shear that improves the that causes the temperature rise, which causes the glacier to melt more, which makes more water between the glacier and the surface of the land and causes the glacier to move faster still. So he goes into this whole business about applying the technology that um, the NSF has already developed to drill cores one and two miles long in the Antarctic and to, to sink, uh, uh, in effect, tubing down there that's heated. Once you hit the bottom and expose that water, it's going to rush up the core that you've just dug because of the pressure. And then what you do is pump it out and pump it further up Antarctica, where you spray it out in the air and it immediately freezes and makes more snow. So it's a very, very interesting process he goes through and the way he talks about it is spot on in terms of how it actually works. And um, the bottom line on this is when they talk about it, this harkens back to the idea that, well, if you were to, you could just pump water back up there. It, and so you could take all the melt water and move it up there. But that turns out to be like 600,000 cubic meter cubic uh, kilometers of water and you can't possibly do that it would take more pipe than has ever been made and it would be outrageously you know pe people can't even conceive of doing that but if you just slow the glaciers down and you get that melt water off their bases so that they go back to grinding along at the old rate at which they used to it's not a complete fix for the problem, but it's a, it's a, it's stopgap that buys you time to find ways to knock down the CO2 in the atmosphere so that the melt doesn't continue in, in Antarctica, so that this problem ultimately goes away. It buys you time to manage the problem. And it's, it's uh, uh, something that we've been doing for a long time. You just switch your idea to pump out this subglacial water. He does a really impressive analysis of the energy it takes to do this. And he says, oh, you know, this, he has the Soviets getting involved in this. They bring down some nuclear submarines to provide nuclear power to run the pumps, to pump the water up and, and, and spew it out over, over the Antarctic ice cap and, and where it refreezes again. And, he also describes how you can use solar power to do that as well as power from the nuclear subs and it's just an absolutely it's the the technology he spends more time on than any other in this system and it's uh, uh it's really it's really fascinating and yes zig we're on a we're on a slippery slope here with these glaciers and he's he discusses very clearly the 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 geoengineering fix to stop that slope from being so slippery and it's it's what he it's he does it very well and it's very compelling yes i, I was just going to say that that uh, it, of those was that if you let those things get out of hand then addressing them technologically is really 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 hard and really 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 expensive yes and it's a um uh, it, it it sounds like it might be sort of like sort of dry sort of uh, engineering science fiction, um, but it's actually quite exciting because you know the they they not all of their efforts succeed, and they kind of get stumped from time to time, and they have to kind of figure out a you know a different approach or or get help from somebody or and things like that. So. Uh, it's actually quite gripping because it, you, it, there are times where you think, "Oh my gosh, this this whole endeavor is going to fail," you know, and then we're screwed, kind of thing. So, so, uh, and you get you get pretty emotionally invested in their success. Well, it took decades. It took decades to start to get a whisper of success. Yeah, and and they do talk. He does talk about the cost of this, and what is it? Something it like was bloody expensive, million dollars or something like that, but. Yeah, you know, as we've been saying in our conversation, but also in the chat conversation, that uh, if society collapses, if civilization collapses, there is uh, no amount of money that is going to bring this back. So um, the sooner we make some of these investments, the less overall cost there's going to be. 
Yes, the, the sections he does on discounting the future and how you calculate these things, I think are, are yes. brilliant and, and marvelous in that regard. And as he said, as, in terms of this glacial melt thing, 10% of the world's population is going to be displaced. 20% of the food supply is disrupted. You know, coastal cities are gone, beaches are gone, marshes are gone. Put a price on that. You know, yes, you that, that, that discussion was fantastic because he talks about the, the future value of money, which yeah. is a well-known uh, financial concept um, that, you know, $10 now um, it, it has a different value than the promise of $15 in the future and that kind of thing. And so uh, by, if, you take, uh, the, if you take into account the time value of money, then what kind of value do you put on you know, the future of all life on Earth. Um, and, you know, that, you know, by one way of thinking about that is the future value of, uh, or the value of the, of the life on Earth continuing on into the future indefinitely is essentially infinite. And since that value is infinite, then anything we pay now to save it is worth it. Yeah, and he gets this down to the more personal as well, uh, and that is, you know, what's what's the future value of your grandchildren? And hence, the ministry for the future. For the future, exactly. That's, that's exactly <laughs> what they're speaking to. Um, there's There was stuff he did about the Arctic that was also fascinating, but... Um, he got into also a restorative agriculture that was all linked into the carbon coin business. And mm -hmm. that was a fascinating business too. But yes, yeah. I, I want to, I want to, since our time, I think is just about up as a yeah, yeah. minute over the bottom line on the book I quoted here, because I think it's, uh, I think it's very, I think it's really what the book is all about. And, and in the very, this is close to the last paragraph of the book, he says, Mary Murphy is realizing that there's no other home for us than here, that we will cope no matter how stupid things get, that the only catastrophe that can't be undone is extinction, that we can make a good place, that people can take their fate in their hands. And then he says that there is no such thing as fate, you know? And, but the thing is, this is why I say he's essentially a, a positivist, and he's not utopian, but he's anti-dystopian. I think he really believes that. And I think by the end of the book, I think we all get the sense that, you know, we're not doing enough, we can do a lot more, and we have to, because we've got to think, as they also say in the book several times, as several, as many um, um, native cultures say, you have to think seven generations ahead. Seven generations ahead. That's and right. That's that's what <laughs> Zig said. He was fated to say that. I think he is. But the point is, I think this is this is really what he's coming down to with all of these topics. That it's all distilled in that set, sentence that there's no other home for us than here, and that the only catastrophe that you can't undo is extinction. So get to work, and and. Um, for all of these things, for the, the political science, as well as the science, as well as the uh, sociological and psychological topics that are raised in the book. Um, it's a marvelous read. And, and I, really think, I really think everybody should read it. And yes, yes Obama does have this on his list of must reads. And I think there's, there's reason for it. I really think everybody should read it. I'd like to recommend the audio book too, which is very good. It, uh, it uses a lot of multiple actor voices for all the various characters and it's very well produced. So I recommend That's the, the one I have too. Yeah. Well, thanks very much. Uh, you know, I want to thank Adelia for bringing this to my attention and to uh, uh, Max and Sumo for, I mean, the, the, for all their hard work to prepare for this discussion. Uh, you know, our, our email threads over the last couple of weeks have been really intense. Uh, preparing for this so um, so and everyone just I really appreciate all your hard work about that and I feel like we still just barely scratched the surface but uh, for now um, let's just say uh, 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 you know good morning good afternoon and good night as uh, 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 to all of you around the world and uh, um, uh, you know maybe we can uh, maybe we can do this again sometime and maybe have a little more follow-up discussion or something I don't know but uh, but I do think there's a lot more to talk. So, yes. 
So thank you all. And thank you, Chantal and the Science Circle for hosting us today and, uh, and promoting uh, the discussion. And, um, uh, and good night. I'll gavel this to a close. Thanks, Matt. Hey, thank you all. Thank you, everyone. And Margaret, thank you for um, moderating the panel here and being part of it. And thank the audience for yes. sticking with us. <laughs> and thanks to Delia for explaining block chains. Oh, I, I, I can, uh, if we want, put onto the, the uh, science circle um, that section from my book that talks that about That was that. good. Oh, I that think that would be good. great. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. I and want a presentation on that sometime. You? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we might need a presentation on uh, on uh, 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 Bitcoin and blockchain too some, at some point. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know who could do that. We need to find an expert, but. Um, I actually know somebody who good. used to be in second <laughs> life who is very much an expert in this. And I don't know whether Perfect. he can come back and talk with us, but I will ask him. We'll see. All right. That'd be fantastic. All right. I'm going to go ahead and uh, hang up on the Zoom call and, and uh, go back into text chat. So thanks again, everyone. It was uh, really fun. Yeah, it was. Thanks. Oh, here we go. Let's see. Bye, how. everybody. Here we go. It was uh, really fun. Yeah, it was. Thanks. Oh, here we go. Let's see. Bye.